The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website. That's newthinkingaloud.org. You can even order a printed copy from mta-magazine.magcloud.com. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the biological field. With me is Dr. Beverly Rubeck, a biophysicist who has published over a hundred scientific papers relating to the biological field, subtle energies, and psychic healing. Beverly is the founder and director and president of the Institute for Frontier Science in Oakland, California. Welcome, Beverly. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's my pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you again after many years. You've devoted much of your career to looking at this elusive notion of the biological field. It's elusive because we tend to think of the human body in reductionistic terms and not in terms of field theory. Absolutely. The conventional view is life is a bag of biomolecules, mm -hmm. and it stops with the skin. And if we elucidate all of the parts according to conventional biology, then we'll understand the whole. But it's really not enough. Yeah. For example, uh, people think that uh, all of the various organs and enzymes and thousands of components of, of a biological system are all programmed by DNA. Yes, and it can't be so that DNA is really regulating and orchestrating millions of things reacting every moment. There's got to be something holistic, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the biofield. Yeah. Now, can you define the biofield? It's sort of elusive, isn't it? Well, the biofield is the organizing energy of life mm -hmm. within and around the organism. And I believe it's also involved in biocommunication and bioregulation mm -hmm. of everything, including the DNA. Now, in earlier generations, there were notions such as vital energy. Is, is that what uh, you're thinking of? Well, we certainly considered that. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, science had a, a history with the notion of the life force. And around 1845, there was a death blow to... Uh, vitalism in biology when someone synthesized a biochemical for the first time in the laboratory. So that was the death blow to vitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet we need a principle of this sort. We can't really explain the wholeness of life, its mm -hmm. incredible coherence and reactivity instant, instant. We can't explain energy healing. We can't explain how extremely subtle fields impact us mm -hmm. without invoking uh, a vital force. And of course, ancient cultures all seem to have an idea of spirit or soul or pneuma or prana, ki or chi, their orgon energy. There, there's so many different ways in which people have tried to express this idea. Absolutely. And not only ancient cultures, but most of the complementary and alternative modalities in medicine, from chiropractic to osteopathy, uh, all of them uh, hold the notion. All yeah. of them hold the notion mm -hmm. of a life force, a vital yeah. field. I mean, in homeopathy, for example, a uh, a remedy is diluted uh, so finely that there may not be a single molecule left. Absolutely. In homeopathy, we start with a mother liquor of some herb or chemical, and we dilute one to ten, and then there's succussion, and eventually we end up with. No more molecules, but still there's a memory of water that mm -hmm. conveys information, and it, it's a therapeutic remedy. And uh, you 
point out that the uh, substance, even if there's not a molecule, it can still there can still be a wave pattern. Yes, and there was a famous experiment uh, by Dr. Luc Montagnier, who is very well known because he's a Nobel Prize winner for co-discovering the HIV virus, mm -hmm. which is associated with AIDS. So he explored uh, DNA as a wave mm -hmm. by taking first uh, a sequence of DNA, say from a virus, and diluting it homeopathically, as we described, and then taking that very dilute, without any more DNA in it, um, completely contained, and putting next to it a sealed test tube of water. And the whole thing was in a Faraday cage and exposed to a conventional carrier wave of 7 hertz, 7 waves per second. Mm -hmm. 24 hours later, he took that pure water and added the components of DNA and an enzyme, and presto, he could synthesize not just DNA, but the original sequence the original, of the viral DNA. The original sequence of viral DNA, which was communicated to a fresh test tube. A fresh test tube of just water. And, and the only thing that seems to have been communicated was the pattern. The pattern of information, uh -huh. exactly. So when we talk about biofields, we're talking about a field that contains information. Yes, and we're talking about a field of energy mm -hmm. that contains information. Uh, Dr. Fritz Popp called it electromagnetic bioinformation. Mm -hmm. I like that term. But your research shows that uh, even when you using Faraday cages, for example, you, you can pretty well eliminate any kind of electromagnetic signal and you're still able to make measurements. Yes, we are. We have uh, discovered something truly novel in that uh, there's obviously a component of the biofield mm -hmm. that even the detectors that we build to look for chi or prana, this elusive life energy, um, shielded from all conventional electric, magnetic, and electromagnetic, and acoustic and thermal energies, something still is getting through to change the properties of our subtle energy detectors. And as you described it to me earlier, that subtle energy detector, maybe as far as 10, 20 feet from your body, for example, is able to pick up on your emotional state, both positive and negative. Yes. So not only are we picking up qi, what qigong masters and energy healers can deliver with intent to heal, mm -hmm. uh, we discovered that we can pick up passion uh, with focus, as well as... Uh, Downers, uh, down emotions, uh, mm -hmm. fear, um, hate, it's anger, etc. Mm -hmm. So the needle moves in the opposite direction. So we have a way of monitoring the emotional field around a person or a group of persons with our new invention, which we call the emotional field detector. And and as we indicated earlier, it couldn't be an electromagnetic field. No. If it, if it is, then it's a component of the electromagnetic field that might have been discarded about a hundred or more years ago. Mm -hmm. Because there was Maxwell, uh, the famous Maxwell equations. Yeah. Uh, that to describe in, the electromagnetic spectrum. Yes. Developed in the 19th century mm -hmm. were once 20 equations. Mm -hmm. But then came engineer Heaviside, a British engineer, mm -hmm who uh, simplified it down to four equations. A heavy side who was kind of heavy-handed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh -huh. he took and made it practical for engineers in a vectorial notation mm -hmm. mathematically. And that's actually what's taught to physicists as well as engineers today. Mm -hmm. So historically, that's what came down. Mm -hmm. And we, we've, we've got to, we had to go backward mm -hmm. historically in science to take a look. What was Maxwell's theory all about? So there were things left out by the heavy side formulation mm -hmm. that is now taught as mainstream. In, in other words, even with regard to conventional electromagnetic energy, uh, there's a lot we still don't understand. I think so. Mm -hmm. Even though we've known about electricity and magnetism for over a hundred years, we've, uh, I would say, developed a certain aspect into conventional circuits mm -hmm. 
But there are other ways to use electricity mm -hmm. and magnetism that mm -hmm. I know Nikola Tesla explored, and his work was also shut down mm -hmm. historically. So we're in a situation today where so much of our understanding of, of science and of uh, nature is based on what we've been able to accomplish technologically, which means that we've probably left a lot out. That's largely the case, and and we tend to see things in terms of our our technological developments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's interesting to think that centuries ago they thought about the brain mind like a book, and then with the invention of the computer, uh, that's become the model, mm -hmm. and even uh, the hologram, which is maybe a step further. Yeah. And uh, Freud referred to the brain-mind system, and I think Jung may have also as sort of a hydraulic system, like a steam engine. <laughs> <laughs> Seems hilarious today. Well, and no doubt in the future there will be other metaphors. Right. Be because we, it seems as if what, this is an example of how we take whatever is the current technology, and that becomes the metaphor for nature. Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. Ditto for the sun. Many... Uh, decades ago, the sun was considered electric. Then, after the discovery of nuclear energy, suddenly the sun was thought to be and taught to be a nuclear inferno. Mm -hmm. And we don't really know if the sun is a nuclear inferno. It's a model. Yeah. And um, so it is with uh, the human being and, and with every other creature, including yes. plants. Now, you, one of one of the areas that you've looked at is the idea that all organisms emit photons. Yes, the so-called biophoton, mm -hmm. the ultra-weak light of life. And this is thought by mainstream science to be nothing more than chemiluminescence due mm -hmm. to free radical reactions and therefore not important. Mm -hmm. They recognize that it exists, but they don't uh, focus on it, whereas... I have taken a look at uh, biophotons with respect to different psychoenergetic states mm -hmm. of subjects mm -hmm. in research. Mm -hmm. And we can see that people can move into a new state of consciousness and try to make light, uh, for example, from this region, which is called the third eye mm -hmm. uh, or the Ajna center, or from the heart in the case of sending energy as a healer, sending mm -hmm. love. And we see somewhere between 100 and 400 percent more light coming from these areas of the body when other areas of the body, such as the hands, remain the same. Now, you took, call it ultra-weak yes. light. And so, it's uh, not normally visible, I suppose. Well, actually, the eye, if we dark adapted our eyes, mm -hmm. we could see a single photon, but you'd have to sit in a dark closet for about five hours. That's amazing. So, we mm -hmm. don't do that, but we have detectors that count photons mm -hmm. called photomultiplier tubes. Yeah. And uh, yes, indeed, the light coming from the human body is something that we need mm -hmm. to count the photons on the order of, say, 20 to 100 photons per second per square centimeter. Mm -hmm. Well, the very notion that the human nervous system, the retina, is capable of detecting a single photon, even if you have to sit in a dark room for five hours to, to make it happen, suggests that uh, these ultra-weak sources of photon emissions could play a, a, a real role in uh, some form of biocommunication between cells or organs of, of the body or between different organisms? Yes, that is certainly so. And one interesting thing about human uh, emission is that the face and the hands are the greatest emitters. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we look at when we communicate yeah. after yeah. all? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, but it's, it's known for the animal kingdom that, mm -hmm. uh, for example, water fleas, Daphnia in water suspension uh, seem to maintain distance based on the biophoton emission. Mm. So, it has a distinct... Um, form of communication in biology. Mm -hmm. So, we, we only surmise that it's so for humans, yeah. but it may be at an unconscious level. Mm -hmm. Well, we seem to have the idea that bigger is better, that a signal has to be strong before we pay attention to it. A weak signal becomes trivial, not important. Uh, but what you're suggesting is that these subtle, weak signals may be very important in biological processes. Absolutely. 
absolutely. The biofield is a very weak field, although it's dynamic and complex and always changing. Mm -hmm. And the human body can respond to exquisitely small electromagnetic fields, really smaller than uh, the thermal noise from molecular vibration. Mm -hmm. And that boggles the mind, really. Mm -hmm. We're talking about really the information conveyed by those signals that somehow we're able to decode through our biofield mm -hmm. as the first receptor of these energies. And in general, I would say the soft, subtle side of nature has been overlooked. Mm -hmm. I, I've called it the feminine face of nature that uh, we've looked uh, and given voice to the large forces of nature. But when it comes to the subtle aspects, we seem to have ignored that. Mm. And I sometimes wonder um, about that in terms of the gender imbalance in science mm -hmm. as well. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and also, in addition to photon emission, there's the acoustic uh, aspect of the biological field. Yes, indeed. And, you know, the heart goes blub, 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 blub. It's the first sound of life. Mm -hmm. We experience this as fetuses in our mother's womb, and it's a very soothing sound. Uh, and, of course, our whole body, every cell uh, is hearing this, even though without ears, but uh -huh. it's acoustically uh, receiving the information, mm -hmm. of course, conveyed through the water matrix of life. At a vibrational level. That's right. It might even be tactile. or Yes, it's more tactile, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, we have all these sensitivities that not only are they generally ignored by mainstream science, but they may play an enormously important role in, in such things as the development of, of an embryo. Certainly. Embryos um, amazingly develop from a single cell divide, make a sphere of cells which becomes hollow, and then the hollow sphere invaginates. And fields must be shaping the development of this. In mm -hmm. fact, the 19th century embryologists called it a morphogenetic field, although they didn't know at the time that it was electromagnetic. Mm -hmm. Well, morphogenetic field is a term, if I recall correctly, used recently by the biologist Rupert Sheldrake to describe uh, uncanny forms of communication amongst biological organisms. Uh, the hundredth monkey example comes to mind where uh, monkeys on one island in Japan learned a, a certain skill. I think it was cracking open coconuts by banging <laughs> them on a rock or something. And, and then in a distant island, uh, miles and miles away, the same species of monkey began uh, doing the same behavior. And, and Sheldrake said that that was a morphogenetic field uh, phenomena. Yes, Sheldrake sort of borrowed the term from embryology, but extended it in a new direction. Mm -hmm. So, there are pioneer scientists who are looking at this. There are a handful. It's mm -hmm. really a minority of people looking at biofield phenomena in nature. But it's certainly important to try to explain how it is that energy healers or psychic healers can influence mm -hmm. us that there are emanations coming from the human body that apparently go beyond uh, conventional energy mm -hmm. and not just affect humans, but I did studies showing effects on bacterial cultures, which certainly document that it's beyond the notion of a placebo. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody could say, well, that's just because you're, you think you're getting something. Somebody's waving their hands around you yeah. and, you know, the biology of belief. Mm -hmm. But when it happens at the level of the cell culture, that heat shock cell cultures that were damaged recover f better from energy healing, from Reiki masters, putting hands around cultures. Um, and then I follow up uh, counting cell numbers of viable cells in standard play count assays. Th these studies were funded by the National Institutes of Health uh, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And yes, indeed, we found positive results. And at this point in time, I, I should think there are probably a hundred studies or, show, or, or so showing the yeah, positive impact of uh, a variety of uh, healing uh, modalities, including distant healing. Actually, I would up that number to probably several hundred mm -hmm. by now. And yet, the mainstream is recalcitrant to change. Part of the reason is we can't publish these studies in mainstream journals. 
There's yeah. a dogma in science, and this is unfortunate, but I would say it's typical of humanity to get locked into its worldview. And, uh, you know, once fame and fortune was built on a certain worldview, it's very difficult to change these people's minds. And as Max Planck said, science advances funeral by funeral. Oh. <laughs> so we wait for the new generation to come in. On, on the other hand, in the old Soviet Union, as I recall back in the 1960s even, uh, they were also looking at psychic healers and uh, telepathy and clairvoyance. And they developed, uh, using their materialistic science, the notion of bioenergetics uh, as a way to uh, explain these things. Things and I believe quite a lot of research was done there. Yes, I look toward Eastern Europe and Russia for a lot of excellent research on subtle energies, uh, torsion fields, as they're called today in physics, mm -hmm. uh, the scalar waves, um, energy healing, psychic healing. And yes, indeed, they did see this uh, as not uh, an aspect of spirituality that they. Uh, saw it as an extension of their materialistic worldview in science. But mm -hmm. somehow, in the West, um, this got mixed up with science and religion, and that's a bad combination. Mm -hmm. So that's often an excuse. Uh, the mainstream does not want to look there. Uh, it's, a, it's forbidden. But you yourself, uh, I gather, are open to seeing uh, the biofield in a spiritual context. Well, I think it's really important mm -hmm. that if we're going to understand life fully, mm -hmm. that we need to uh, go as far as we can with science to explore the soul. Mm -hmm. And I see the biofield as really having one foot in the metaphysical realm and one foot in the physical realm. It, it may be as close as we can go toward mm -hmm. that exploration, at least in my lifetime. I know the ancient Vedanta philosophy talked about sheaths in which uh, various levels of subtlety were enclosed. For example, you, you get the material, physical body, but then you have the etheric body, and then you have maybe the mental body, and then you have the, the Buddha body, and, uh, and so on. Increasing uh, levels of, of subtlety, I think they would say, of, of magic. Matter. I think that's so, and I think that uh, we are detecting part of that emotional body, mm -hmm. the emotional soma, and especially as it extends outward from the human body. Using your detector. Using our uh, novel subtle energy detector. Yeah, exactly. and uh, psychics, of course, uh, as well as mystics of many varieties, have uh, reported seeing auras or energy fields around humans and, and other animals. And part of the biofield is not not only within the body, but extending outward. Mm -hmm. Although the word aura is so popular and uh, would really discredit scientists to use it. So yeah. we developed that word biofield mm -hmm. uh, just to avoid that lingo. Well, and I've always suspected personally that the aura is an example of synesthesia uh, because different every psychic I know sees it differently. It's not as if they're seeing the same thing, but I believe what they're doing is picking up information intuitively, maybe clairvoyantly. It gets displayed in uh, what we could call the sensorium of the mind as a visual image. Uh, just the way synesthesia works, where people can see music, for example. Right. I think it's certainly true. And when you speak to clairvoyants, they all have their own method, uh, their own synesthesia, mm -hmm. uh, their own way of relating to these phenomena. So, yeah. um, it's interesting. And it gets uh, very complex when you add that, that the synesthesia dimension to it because there may well be a, a, a biological field. In, in fact, you're quite certain there is around everyone. Well, and that's why we've been developing instrumentation as mm -hmm. well as utilizing um, off-the-shelf commercial instrumentation mm -hmm. to try to measure it. But we really need a human energy project. Mm -hmm. We had a human genome project which was uh, funded billions of dollars and leadership from major governments uh, around the world. And that led to the rather unlightened uh, fact that we are 
we have less genes than a grain of rice. Isn't that fascinating? It's amazing. I mean, certainly we have more complexity than rice. So what happened? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of so-called junk DNA. Mm -hmm. That's DNA that we don't really understand what it does, but I think it's really regulating the other genes. Mm -hmm. But it really shows that epigenetics, the the control of those genes is key. And that's where the biofield comes in. I do believe that the energy field of the body is helping regulate which genes are turned on and mm -hmm. turned off. Interesting. So, uh, and I also believe that the mind is the ultimate regulator, or the conductor of the symphony of the energy field mm -hmm. of life. And this goes back to Oriental philosophy where um, where mind goes, chi flows, and blood follows chi. So mind is primary, consciousness is primary. The biofield is a bridge between the mind and the flesh. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of effects of, of consciousness on the body. Uh, this is mind-body medicine. Uh, we need to explore that biofield, and we need a human energy project, just like we had that human genome project. Mm -hmm. I've been advocating this for decades, and I do hope it happens. <laughs> well, you were instrumental in getting the National Institutes of Health to recognize the concept of the biofield officially. I was. I, I worked with a team at NIH in the early 90s. We needed a term. We looked at chi, prana, ki, etc., and we said we can't take an ethnic-laden term. We need a new mm -hmm. word. So we coined by a biofield, and then we made it. We worked hard to make it a medical subject heading at the National Library of Medicine. Mm -hmm. That was important then because we didn't have all these great search engines on the internet as we have today, like Scholar Google. Yeah. So. Uh, yes, indeed, it's a medical search term mm -hmm. in PubMed, pubmed.com. Mm -hmm. So at least that's the first step. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. And I know uh, long before the Genome Project, uh, I mean, it took decades uh, to launch the Genome Project. Uh, be, and during that whole preliminary period, people understood genes are very, very important. So, uh, uh, one, I can be optimistic to think someday there will be a human biofield project be, because it's complex and, right. and important. I think the human biofield is the most complex dynamical field that we mm -hmm. know of. More complicated than any other organism, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's always changing instant to instant as yeah. we shift mm -hmm. and as our minds are shifting. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it would be a very worthwhile activity. We would really fully understand what it means to be human uh, at another level mm -hmm. if we could extend science. And it would be a key to solving the so-called hard problem of consciousness, which is why are we uh, physical uh, creatures made out of matter conscious at all? It's part of it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But what is the essence of consciousness is yet another question, mm -hmm. I think. It's and that's quite, a really tough question. It's a big mystery. <laughs> and, and of course, as a parapsychologist, I get into the more exotic elements of consciousness, like, like how can consciousness influence distant systems? And uh, th there, the biofield uh, may be another uh, very creative solution. Yes, and I know parapsychology threw out the notion of fields playing a role, mm -hmm. and they thought, they went to the quantum and they said it must be some quantum entanglement, um, Bell's well, theorem and things. But, but frankly, I mm -hmm. think there are, it may well be that not all the fields of life mm -hmm. uh, diminish over distance according to the inverse R squared law. Right. So that really, it's possible that certain longitudinal waves do not lose uh, their content. Laser over beams distance. don't. Well, laser beams, they lose something, but, mm -hmm. but in any case, there is a, a, the concept of longitudinal waves, which was in original Maxwell equations that uh -huh. was diminished and uh -huh. disregarded now for over a hundred years, yeah. may save the day. It may actually be a modality that could convey uh, some of those distant uh, effects that we see in psi research mm -hmm. and distant healing. I see. And I think, to be fair, Beverly, parapsychologists didn't really discard the notion of, of biofields because there's only a handful of parapsychologists in any case who uh, they they all have their personal preferences, and if you begin to talk to them, you find there are many disagreements. Well, that's for sure. 
There, there's yeah. no unified way of thinking in these frontier areas. Which, which is both uh, a liability and a plus. I think it's great, actually. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's definitely missing from conventional science where things have gotten so gelled or concretized, not just gelled, mm -hmm. concretized into dogma. Yeah. And then we lose a lot because the minute you discover an anomaly that challenges the dogma, uh, you're rejected mm -hmm. and ostracized and you can't publish easily. Mm -hmm. Even if you were a tenured professor and um, there are several of these that, whom I know and I, it's just terrible to see how the mainstream can uh, drag its feet in really examining evidence. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned instrumentation, and, I, and you've also talked about the uh, device that uh, you've developed in your laboratory uh, for measuring subtle energies. I know you also work with uh, the most recent iteration of uh, the Curlian photography devices that are being manufactured in Russia today. Yes, indeed. And of course, this came out of, it was 1948 when Dr. Curlian invented this, but mm -hmm. of course it was done with film for many years. And yeah. just as regular photography went digital, so did high voltage electrophotography, which means that you send a charge of 5,000 volts or so to the fingertips. Mm -hmm. And then we examine the corona discharge of the induced light emission from mm -hmm. each fingertip, which we, we then analyze and we can say things about the status of health and wellness. Mm -hmm. And well, one of the things that uh, I gather from this work is that it's similar to such fields as uh, people who work with the iris, people who work with the ear, people who work with acupuncture, that the, the body functions almost holographically so that the fingertips map out all the other functions of the body. That's an interesting thing. Yes, the ear and the hand are considered uh, homunculus, is the mm -hmm. word, a dwarfed representation of the whole. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, in Korean hand therapy, which is a form of uh, an acupuncture system, this is the head, these are the arms, and these are the legs. Think of a little critter. Ahead. And so, uh, this image would relate to the head. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that's part of the software analysis. But the Russians have a very large database of many people they've studied, healthy as well as ill, and they've mapped where certain disorders show up, etc. It's really quite amazing, the mm -hmm. software that goes with uh, these devices. Mm -hmm. So you're able to uh, measure the, uh, the corona discharge around the fingertips of, of people before and after meditation, before and after healing, and uh, before and after relaxation processes, you see a real difference. We do, especially in beginners, people who are not well energy regulated because mm -hmm. they don't have a spiritual practice or a mind-body practice, mm -hmm. because they're often, they look um, disheveled in the energy field, you know. Uh, there's sometimes gaps, missing parts, there's yeah. left-right imbalances. But mm -hmm. after doing maybe one meditation, one yoga class, presto, the biofield really improves. Mm -hmm. And yet we don't see that on the long-term meditators or yogis because they're already in the zone. Mm -hmm. They're well-regulated mm -hmm. and one more yoga class or meditation time does not impact them as much. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are people, intuitives, who are able to uh, do intuitive medical diagnosis, for example. I imagine they're picking up on this field. Yes, indeed. And I once compared... Um, an intuitive to what I could measure with the biofield. And there was some correspondence. I mm -hmm. was very gratified by that. Yeah. But speaking of medical intuitives, we had, uh, we studied a medical intuitive for her own biofield mm -hmm. in the biophoton chamber. Mm -hmm. And we could measure this area. This is called the Ajna Center, yeah. uh, also known as the third eye. It's one of the key energy mm -hmm. centers in the, the biofield. The biophoton chamber is something you and your partner developed in your laboratory. Yes, because mm -hmm. we wanted to not only study single persons, but people interacting, yeah. such as energy healers mm -hmm. and patients, but just in this one case, which was so fascinating, because in her normal resting ordinary state, mm -hmm. the photon count was about what most people get, uh, about 20 photons per second per square centimeter here. Mm -hmm. But in her intuitive I open the third eye open state, mm -hmm. it was twice as large, mm -hmm. um, between 70% and 100% as large mm -hmm. in multiple trials. Whereas the other 
um, emissions from her hands or her heart area did not shift. Mm -hmm. But this was her deliberate opening and closing of the third eye. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So there's definitely a shift with a change in consciousness in the biofield. Mm -hmm. So we're really, uh, we're really validating ancient oriental concepts that where the mind mm -hmm. goes, the energy flows. When you mentioned the term the third eye, which is also known as the Ajna chakra for people who are familiar with the chakra system, it's, it's not only about a biofield, it's about subtle organs in, in the body associated uh, in some people's minds with acupuncture meridians and uh, with different emotional centers of the body. And, and I gather you find that there's, uh, using your measurements, uh, a lot of validity to these uh, detailed ancient concepts. Yes, indeed. We also found no matter if you're right-handed or left-handed, the right palm emits more light than the left hand, mm. which is again consistent with oriental theory that this, the left hand is yin, mm -hmm. the right hand is yang, mm. and yin is more receptive, yeah. the feminine archetype and the masculine archetype is more ex exerting energy. Uh -huh. And I've also measured that from energy healers in particular, that the right hand is always a great, stronger emitter. Mm -hmm. So, th this concept of the bio field enables you to comfortably, as, as a biophysicist, uh, work with healers. Yes, we've studied a number of healers as well as Qigong masters and other people with uh, extraordinary abilities and uh, who've refined their abilities over many years. Mm -hmm. And then we've worked with them, for example, in the biophoton chamber, patients and energy healers together mm -hmm. in healing sessions. I can say that no two healing sessions are alike. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of uh, bursts of light that occurred during the energy healing, they were all unique. Mm -hmm. And that was another gratifying thing. And it yeah. fits with life. Uh, mm -hmm. You go to a practitioner, your experiences are very different day to day, person to person. Mm -hmm. It doesn't surprise me. It's the essence of being human. It's mm -hmm. how we relate. Well, and, and also when we talk about the biological field, it's not just humans. It's, it's the whole ecosystem. All the plants and all the animals are uh, communicating with each other at this energetic level. I think so. Yes. And we even did some studies on agriculture to mm -hmm. try to uh, compare different methods um, of uh, composting with animal manure and without manure and, and then the commercial uh, vegetables in the supermarket that yeah. may be GMOs or mm -hmm. at least conventional agriculture. And we found yeah. differences in the light emission. In measuring the biophotons. Measuring biophotons, which is a kind of uh, biofield from uh -huh. vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Well, the in, to me, one of the unique aspects of a field as opposed to an organism, an organism has a boundary, a membrane, a skin, in, for example, but a field does not. The field extends infinitely, does it not? Yes, it does. It has no boundaries, mm -hmm. whereas uh, biomolecules in the skin is a definite boundary in, mm -hmm. in the chemical view of life. In the biophysical view of life, we are like stars radiating Mm -hmm. Throughout the universe, there's there's no limit. So it's really a completely different way of understanding ourselves, understanding what it means to be a human being. Yes, indeed. And I also see it as complementary to, and I'm not discarding the particle view of life. Mm -hmm. You know, in physics, we have a great principle called complementarity. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, even light behaves like a particle. We yeah. call it a photon. Right. And on the other hand, it behaves like a wave. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of us. It's true of all levels of nature. Where there's a particle, there's a complementary view of it as a wave. Mm -hmm. And it just depends on your measuring instruments, uh, which one you're going to detect. Well, I suppose it's, it's fair to say that in popular culture, uh, the term vibration, uh, uh, the idea that we can think of the way we vibrate, it's been around in popular music and uh, popular ways of expressing. I think people intuitively understand it. I think people intuitively understand. And actually, our receptors, they're actually antenna mm -hmm. for the biofields of others. So, mm -hmm. we know you don't have to look at someone. You walk in the room and you know energetically, um, you know, if someone's angry or someone's in a loving state, mm -hmm. um, the facial recognition may add something, but there's already 
a sensing going on at a subconscious level. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we could talk about this forever. We haven't even brought up, for example, Franz Anton Mesmer and his notion of animal magnetism. Uh, I, I, I know there are many, many other examples. Wilhelm Reich and orgone energy is, is, is another recent one. But uh, I think we've pretty well covered uh, your work in this area now. Well, Dr. Beverly Rubick, what a pleasure to be with you and to uh, share your passion for, for this important and neglected area of science. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.